In the previous lecture, we found out that scientists are human and they make errors and they sometimes commit fraud. Um, but why would they sort of deliberately or unconsciously manipulate their work or, or the way they report their work to uh, sort of falsify or, or, um, or bias their data? And in this part of the lecture, we're going to argue that this is because of the incentives that exist in the system in which scientists work and, and publish. So this problem of the incentives or the perverse incentives, as um, as Stuart Ritchie calls it, can be looked at in three ways. And we're going to look at um, publication, so how you get your paper into a journal and what biases that might include along the way. Uh, peer review, which is a, an in essential part of the scientific process and that consists of other scientists looking at your work as well as some input from the journals themselves and the third this notion of prestige the idea that some journals seem to be better than others the role that social media might play in enhancing or highlighting or ranking academics work and the role that national league tables and newspapers might play in also setting standards for academics to live to so the first domain of problems then here is publication. And there's an often quoted thing which people say, publish or perish. And that's the idea that to be a scientist, you really need to publish. You can't get away without publishing your work. You can't, be, you can't remain an academic. You can't, you know, if you finish your PhD and you haven't got any papers ready to publish, then it's a problem and it's very hard then to get onto the job market. And the academic paper is like the unit of currency, the coin of science. So you can measure your career in how many papers you've published. You can uh, trade papers with each other at a conference. You can sort of buy and sell things according to papers. So you can employ someone on the basis of how many papers they've got. So the paper, the, the scientific paper, really is sort of the, the entry point for a scientist to get into the system. And to write and submit a paper, I mean, first you need to do the research, of course. So do some research, whatever it is. It could be a project a year long or a few months long, or it could be a five-year project. And to write and submit a paper for publication, you're going to need first some sort of job or studentship, some sort of position in an academic department. It's very difficult to collect data and do science without support of an institution. You'll need a laboratory in that institution to collect the data or to analyze or hold the data colleagues to advise you, mentors, supervisors, other people to help you write the paper. Typically a psychology paper might have between two and five authors. It's quite common. In other fields it could be hundreds of authors or in other fields it could be a single author. And of course all this takes time so you need a lot of time. Um, you might spend three months collecting data for your paper but you could easily spend the next three to six months analysing and, and writing it up. And sometimes it takes years so I've still got papers from you know 14 years ago that I'm still trying to write up. So in each of these stages, there's going to be lots of different people uh, trying to do the same thing. So people are competing for jobs and studentships. People are competing for space in laboratories, for both physically and sort of uh, mental space to, to work in a particular laboratory. Colleagues and mentors and co-authors can only do so much. They can only help so many people. And of course, time is limited. Your studentship might run out and there might be some sort of national emergency where you have to stop collecting data and stop writing papers. So each of these stages is subject to pressures and resources and competition. And it's possible then that the publication stage is actually where a lot of these biases might come in because there's so much pressure and so much competition. So let's look at the, the publications and the journals themselves. There are thousands of academic journals. You've probably come across a number of psychological journals, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Psychological Science, for example. Uh, but there are hundreds and thousands of journals across different scientific fields. Each one has slightly different rules and slightly different formats and slightly, they cover slightly different kinds of work. But in general, academic journals tend to want to publish novel, interesting and exciting work. So novel, of course, it should be new. It shouldn't be plagiarised, although some people get away with that. It should be novel in that you're trying you're looking at a new thing or you're answering a new question or you're uh, coming up with a new answer it should be interesting so there should be some interest for the readers of the journal they shouldn't just want to read the same old thing and in some sense it should be exciting now this of course differs all these things differ across the journals so the most prestigious journals if you like will apply these rules the strictest and the least prestigious might not apply them at all and also journals tend to want positive results 
And I don't mean feel-good results, but I mean results where you find a positive difference, so a significant effect in statistical terms. So it's very difficult to publish things which show no difference between two conditions or between two treatment groups or no correlation between two variables, but it's easier to publish things which show positive differences between groups or correlations. Journals also tend to want clear and consistent results. So if you have three or four experiments, they might require you to show the same thing in all of the three or four experiments. Even though that may be statistically unnecessary, they may require you to do it. And they may, they may require that your results are also consistent with the external literature, so it's sort of in external consistency. And that, again, may be good or bad. If you're going against the rest of the literature, it may be harder for you to publish because there's, there's less evidence for your results. And of course, all of these journals are essentially magazines, and they, they sell their magazines to universities and sometimes to the general public. And so they're often looking for a good story, and they're profit-making companies, and, and they need to sell their product. So all of these things, are they sort of characterise journals in general, and they especially characterise the most popular or the most prestigious journals. Um, but none of these points are about doing good and rigorous science. They're just about having sort of nice results. So they're not about the quality of your science, and they are about the niceness of your results. And so it's unfortunate that you could be an excellent scientist, you could be the very best scientist in your group, in your department. But if you happen to be working on a, on a hypothesis that turns out to be false, then it, it might actually be harder to publish. You could do really good work showing that something isn't true, or finding that something isn't true. And then it, it just, it's unfortunate that you're, it's then harder to publish. Or you could publish it, but in, in a journal that wouldn't be as, as prestigious or as or read as often as other positive results. So journals then, by, by looking for good stories, rather than just for rigorous science, they exert further pressures on scientists to try and make their stories good. So that was the journals. What about individual scientists in the peer review process? If you're on social media, especially Twitter, there's lots of comments about peer reviewers, particularly reviewer two is a meme and review to, reviewer two is always the bad one. But in this, in, this, uh, in this image on the screen there, it's reviewer three that's the bad one. So this is a, this is a typical a typical sort of a experience of reviews of a paper. So you, you write a paper and you submit it to peer review and that means that two or three people will have a look at your paper and give you some comments and you'll, you'll have to address those comments in a next version of your paper. And so in the image on the left you've got the entire contents of your paper in blue. That's a big thing. You, you've taken a lot of time and a lot of effort to make that, make that paper work. And then reviewer one will give you comments on a small section of the paper in yellow Reviewer 2 will give you comments on a small section of the paper, that's in, in red. And then some reviewers will sometimes sort of comment on things you haven't done uh, and tell you what you should have done, and that's that can be quite frustrating. So peer review is supposed to be one of the hallmarks of objective quality science. You often hear this in the news, in the media, outside of science and psychology. They'll very commonly say on the radio, for example, this study was peer-reviewed, or this was published in a peer-reviewed journal, or and that, that's and that's supposed to say that it's it's sort of good science, whereas they might often say, but but this study hasn't been peer reviewed and therefore it should be taken with caution. And that is of course true, and that's how the scientific process works. But it's not absolute. So published or peer reviewed is not the same as being good. Uh, and remember, of course, that peer review is done by humans, and we're we're all humans. We're all subject to the same scientific biases that we talked about in the first part of this lecture. And so it should be no surprise at all that the biases of individual scientists are the same as the biases of individual peer reviewers. So you submit your paper, you get an editor, might look at it briefly, uh, they might send it to two or three hopefully expert reviewers, and if everyone likes it the paper might sort of get through and be, be accepted after perhaps some revisions. So overall you've got maybe three or four people per journal who look at your work. And so that's peer review. It's three or four other people. Now the publication process is typically not straightforward. So you don't typically just write your paper, submit it to a journal, it's then commented and reviewed and then accepted. Uh, this flow diagram represents the various stages of, of writing a paper and getting it submitted. 
Um, and probably the longest stage in this process, I mean, after researching and writing, the longest stage is the peer review process, and that um, that can go around in circles for a while, in fact. So one strategy of publication might be to send your, your article first to the best journal in your list, the best journal in your field. That could be nature or science, for example, if you're looking at general scientific articles, or it could be psychological science for a psychology article. So you'll send it to that journal, and that journal will have a look, and almost certainly they'll reject your, your article. And they, won't, they probably won't even send it to reviewers. The editor will just have a look uh, and say, no, this is not for us. And psychological science, being the best journal in the field, might reject 95% of articles, and probably the vast majority, at least 75% of those, will be based on just the editor having a look and thinking, no, this doesn't look exciting enough for our journal. So you get the rejection from the editor, and then you choose a new journal. Let's say you now send it to Journal of Experimental Psychology. Now they might reject about 75% of articles on the first go, but this time, luckily, you've been you've been uh, caught in that 25%, and so they decide to send it to reviewers who will give you comments. And that's the peer review box up there, and they might give you one round of comments, and then you address those comments. Perhaps you have to change some of your analyses or uh, provide a bit more background information or discuss some of the more some of the problematic elements of your paper, or they might ask you to collect more data to do another experiment. But even at this stage, they, even if they've asked you to review the paper, to revise the paper, they could still reject the paper after you know the second round of reviews. They might decide you haven't met the requirements of the journal and then reject you again. And so then you go back to another journal and start the whole process again. So particularly for young scientists or scientists who are trying to make their careers, it could be quite important to choose the best journal in your field submit to that journal and then start the process. So it could be many, many months of revising and rewriting and resubmitting your work to get it published. The good news, I suppose, is that there are so many journals now and even lots of scam journals that aren't really <laughs> that aren't really academic journals. Um, so there's so many journals that you, you, you can publish your work or almost anywhere. And so there is a real competition for space in the best journals and that's why the journals might exert some sort of selection pressures on the papers they publish. The final part of this section is going to be on prestige. So why on earth would scientists even bother submitting to journals that reject 95% of articles on average? And indeed, and I, I tend not to do that, I tend to go for a, a boring middle journal just because <laughs> it's quicker. So there is a hierarchy of journals in people's imaginations and in people's sort of general feelings, but there's also there's also a number that you can use to rank the journals into sort of a rank order of best to worst. Um, and I gave a whole talk about this number last year at the university, which you can watch. I'm not even going to mention this number because it's a it's an appalling number. Um, it, but this number has come to dominate scientific publish, publishing, prestige, and even promotion in some cases. So individual scientists are sometimes promoted on the basis of this number, even though this number applies to journals and not to scientists. Worse about this number, it's been around for about 60 years, but it's, it's incorrectly analysed, it's a biased number, it's flawed, it's incomplete, and it's widely criticised over at least 40 years. So if this number was being submitted uh, to a peer review, it would almost certainly be uh, rejected from a good journal. But scientists, administrators and edit editors in the whole of science and in psychology still use this number to rank the journals and even to rank individual scientists. So that number and that apparent prestige of these different journals explains why scientists would try and submit to the very best journals which are most likely to reject their work and they, they, they submit less to the what they perceive as the worst journals which have a lower number. And this idea of putting numbers to everything is not just in journals. In the age of information and social media and um, the internet, almost everything is ranked and scored and numbered. So individual papers can be looked at in terms of their citations or their numbers of exposure on social media. Individual people can be looked at in the same way. And there's companies like Altmetric who will provide a score for each individual person and, and paper and institution. Also, we put ourselves on various kinds of scientific social media. And these social media provide us with scores. So uh, Google Scholar is really useful for finding articles and academics really should be on there because it, it boosts your exposure. It boosts the number of 
times people look at your papers and they give you a score and they show all your numbers uh, and as does ResearchGate. ResearchGate tries and calculates a whole score for your entire career and it puts it right up top next to your name what your current score is. And of course it's not just scientists but it's, um, it's universities and institutions. Remember you can rate your course in the National Student Survey which runs once a year for every undergraduate student. You can rate your lecturers online and of course all of these sorts of ratings will be used in newspapers and in government agencies and in many different ways to create league tables and rankings and scoring systems. Now none of these scoring systems are based on the quality of the science. None of them. And that's the problem. So over the last few decades I suppose uh, the advent of the internet and the, the rise of the, the rankings and the social media and the ratings and rankings are pushing scientists to, to try and get more money, to produce more papers, to publish their papers in better journals. And we're all feeding into this system. Journals, universities, newspapers, government, social media and scientists are all encouraging this system of metricizing and numbering and ranking. And Uta Frith, who is an esteemed uh, emeritus professor, she's lamented this rise of fast science, where everyone is trying to, to work quicker and faster and get more and do more. And it's this sort of fast science that has led to the replication crisis in psychology. And the replication crisis, it's, it's a look at this whole situation that we're in, where people are not following scientific practice carefully enough, they're biased, they're sometimes fraudulent, they're publishing papers in journals which are not really interested in the quality of the science, they're more interested in the, in the message or the story or the positive results. And all of these biases and processes and pressures lead to a situation in which, in which much psychological research doesn't seem very reliable. It's a very common phenomenon that when you, when you enter a new field of study, you can try and replicate something, someone's previous work, and it won't work. You can't replicate many previous results. And over the last five years, starting with the Open Science Collaboration in 2015, there's been a massive effort to try and reproduce classic effects in psychology and to try and see what in our, in our science is really reliable. And the news is not good from that Open Science Collaboration. It's not as good as you would hope. It's certainly better than nothing. There's certainly something in, in, in modern psychology which is of value. But we're not really ready to deal with this problem of failures to replicate psychological research. We don't have the tools available to deal with this problem and we need to change our culture. So is there any hope at all for psychology? That's the question for the second half of the lecture. There's Uta Frith. Any questions, please put them in the Q&A. I'll see you shortly.